Hey everyone, John Lorden here. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked. This is actually our second to last episode for the year. I can't believe this year is almost finished already. Uh, I'm going to be off next week, so I just wanna get the word out. I don't want anyone worrying about it, so I'm gonna mention it on every video this week. I'm off next week. However, on December 31st, New Year's Eve, we will have another episode of Brain Scratch Case Cracked, and the following day on January 1st, New Year's Day, a new episode of Crime After Crime, the podcast with Danielle Hallen and myself is also coming out. So I wanted to let you know about all that stuff. Uh, on top of that, I have kind of a special announcement. I'm really proud to be talking about this before we start today's episode. Um, you may have seen a name in the credits. You've probably seen her in the comment threads. You've probably heard me thank her several times if you're a long-term brain scratcher. Christy Arnhart is now a co-producer on this show. She is also co-writing the episodes. We've been working very closely. Uh, basically, I have a lot of kind of special projects that are gonna be coming up next year. And Christy is really stepping up to help me. Uh, she is also becoming the first regular contractor, I guess you could say, for the Lord and Arts channel. Uh, and that's something that I've wanted for a long time, just to be able to pay someone for their work. Christy has been so kind to donate her time and energy to this channel for years now. Uh, and I'm happy that we're finally at a spot where we can formalize that. So please join me in thanking and congratulating Christy. Christy, thank you so much for all your support over the years. I just really appreciate it. And I wanted to be sure to share that publicly. I know I've told you that in private, but I want everyone to know how much you've been a fundamental part of this channel and its growth. And I'm so proud that we're working together on Case Cracked in this more significant way going forward. So this episode, co-written by Christy Arnhart and John Lorden, is called The Afterlife of Richard Hoagland. While working on a family project in April of 2013, the nephew of a man named Terry Samansky found his uncle on the website Ancestry.com. Knowing his uncle had died in 1991, the nephew was shocked to find a marriage license for his uncle from 1995. For three years, the family delayed contacting authorities out of fear that the imposter might come after them. Finally, in 2016, they decided to come forward. Investigators would find that the deceased Terry Samansky's identity had been stolen by another man who was supposedly dead, Richard Hoagland. After fleeing his life in Indiana in 1993, Hoagland made his way to Florida where he rented an apartment from an older man named Edward Samansky. Edward was grieving. Just two years earlier in 1991, his son, Terry, an Ohio-born fisherman, had been killed in an accident at sea. Edward's new tenant would often stay up listening to the heart-sick father talk about his son. My dad was grieving and pouring his heart out, Szymanski's daughter, Cynthia Bujnak, told People. Hoagland lived with Edward until he died of natural causes in 1994. This is how deputies think Hoagland stole Terry's identity. After living with Edward Szymanski in Palm Beach, Hoagland found a copy of Terry's death certificate and used it to obtain a birth certificate from Ohio. With the birth certificate in hand, he then applied by mail for an Alabama driver's license and used that to obtain a Florida driver's license. A year later, he moved to Tampa Bay where he met his third wife, Mary, with whom he would go on to have a son. July, 2016. He's living the life. He has a child with his third wife. They have no idea about his previous life, Sheriff Noko from the Pasco County Sheriff's Office said. He worked odd jobs. The family bought properties and rented them out. He even got a pilot's license. But after 20 years, Hoagland's long ruse was finally undone by Ancestry.com. After his current wife, Mary, found out about his past, she searched their attic and found his real identification documents in a briefcase. She also found several other secrets, a deed to a Louisiana property, a key to a storage unit. Mary told police that she always had questions, but he would always come up with an explanation. On a beautiful summer day that same year, Linda Eisler, Hoagland's second wife, received a voicemail from Detective Anthony Cardillo of the Pasco County Sheriff's Department in Florida. 
He asked me if I knew who Richard Hoagland was, and I said, yes, that's my ex-husband, Linda said. He said, we have him in custody. Police told her that he had been living as a man named Terry Samansky in Florida. Linda told deputies that before he disappeared in the early 90s, Hoagland stated that he had to disappear because he had stolen millions and was wanted by the FBI. Linda states that Richard Hoagland had three businesses that were related to insurance, Sheriff Noko said. She told Sheriff Noko that Hoagland had embezzled over $1 million. To date, nothing in the investigation has shown any signs of embezzlement, and he is actually not wanted by the FBI. Upon his arrest, Hoagland told deputies he left Indiana just to get away from his second wife. She had a different perspective on their relationship. He was very spontaneous. He was a shaker and a roller. He was always doing, making deals and doing things. He was very successful, Linda said. He was a lot of fun to be with. She met Hoagland in Indiana in the 1980s after he divorced his first wife, having two children from that marriage. Their marriage was a prosperous one. Two more children were born to them, Matthew and Douglas, who were nine and six at the time of his disappearance. The family had a big house, along with a steady income and exotic vacations, but their seemingly perfect relationship would come to an end on February 10th, 1993, at 4.45 p.m. after 11 years of marriage. He called me at work and told me that he was ill and that he needed to go to the emergency room, Linda recalled. And I said, well, why don't you just wait and I'll go with you? He said, no, I don't have time to wait. After hearing nothing else from him, she started calling the area hospitals. There was no trace of him in any of them. Hoagland had vanished. His toothbrush was still there. He didn't pack any clothes. It was cold. It was in February. He didn't take a coat, Linda said. Hoagland hadn't even taken his passport. He called again at 5.40 p.m. to say goodbye. Linda noted the conversation in a journal that she kept. Quote, I can't live this way anymore, he told her. I feel you would be better off without me. Richard called again that night. I don't want to go to jail, he told her. I'm never coming back. Authorities eventually found Hoagland's car abandoned at Indianapolis International Airport, but there was no record of a Richard Hoagland taking any flights out of the airport the day he went missing. Nothing was heard from or about Hoagland until that summer when his two sons both received a birthday card from their father, each containing $50. Douglas's card read, Have a super birthday. You are a super boy. I love you and miss seeing you. Let your mom help spend this money. You might want to put some away. Maybe sometime soon, we will get to see each other. I bet I won't even know you it's been so long. Mind your mother. Bye, Dad. That was the last time they heard from their father. Soon after receiving the cards, or maybe because of it, police viewed Linda as a suspect in his disappearance. They interrogated me over and over and over. They alluded a lot to the possibility that he was involved in some type of drug trafficking, which I had no clue, Linda said. The family lost their house and cars after he vanished. Luckily, Linda's mother stepped in to help. He devastated us. He left us with nothing, absolutely nothing. I was very broken, she said. After 10 years in 2003, Hoagland was declared legally dead. Linda eventually found love again and moved on remarrying. Hoagland's son, Douglas, was inside an Indiana jail when he heard the news about his father. For years, drug use had brought him in and out of state lockups. I started messing around with drugs in early high school, said Douglas. I broke my hand, was prescribed narcotics. It was off to the races after that. While serving an eight-year stretch, one night the television began running a story about a Florida family man who had been living under a false identity for more than two decades. The mugshot accompanying the piece showed a 63-year-old with close-cropped graying hair and glasses who Douglas recognized immediately as his father. Douglas sat down to pen a letter to his father. For a long time, I wondered what was wrong with me that would warrant someone being able to just walk away, he wrote. I'm sure the big underlying question for everyone is why? What was so bad that you had to disappear? 
Douglas linked his drug use to his father's exit, though he didn't blame his problem on the disappearance. At a very young age, I lost a person that I thought loved me, Douglas wrote. I had a very low self-esteem and that affected my drug use even more. I used drugs to get my confidence since at times I felt less than I really was. Hoagland was charged with fraudulent use of personal identification. In February 2017, he pleaded guilty to a charge of aggravated identity theft. He served nearly two years in federal prison before returning to Indiana. This doesn't seem like enough after all the heartache this man caused to multiple families with 20 years of lies. Luckily, Hoagland's second wife, Linda, had come up with a way to make him pay. Linda sought child support for the children dating back all the way to the early 1990s, including payment for costs to send the children to college. A court ruling in Hamilton County awarded nearly $2 million in back child support to Linda. That includes nearly $1.4 million simply in interest charged to payments that should have been made starting in 1993. A decision on whether Hoagland should pay back attorney's fees totaling $40,000 to Linda is still pending. I was glad that we finally had made it to that point where he would be held accountable for his behavior, Linda says. Douglas, who was out of custody, was on hand for the recent court hearing. It was the first time he had seen his father since 1993. If you think you had two kids and you wanted to see them so bad, you'd think you'd be a little bit emotional, Douglas recalled to the star. But this guy? Nothing. Also considered is the fact that it was clear Richard was not living in poverty, but had obtained a comfortable lifestyle, had remarried and had children, obtained a pilot's license, and owned at least one airplane that was acquired for personal use, court documents stated. It's unclear if Linda and her sons will actually get any money from the judgment that she won. Hoagland's assets are now tied up in divorce proceedings with his third wife, Mary, back in Florida. Case cracked. And what a case. And what a lot of cracks. Um, yeah, I, I just can't believe what this man has put so many people through. And I think the thing that hurts me the most is uh, his children to, to just up and disappear like that. Um, with them being at such a young, tender age, it, it just, I don't know how you could do that. But obviously, people are able to do that and still put new lives together. The whole thing just really hits me as ridiculous. I mean, if you're that unhappy in your marriage, get a divorce. I mean, it's really, do you have to go to these lengths? I mean, you were declared dead. You're stealing another person's identity. Uh, and what, what about that family? What about everything that they were put through? First of all, finding this marriage certificate that didn't make sense for an uncle that was supposedly deceased several years before. It just, it hurts so many people when you see someone be this selfish in this way. And there is a very different path that you can take and still have all this stuff. If he simply would have done the right thing at the time, told Linda he wasn't happy in the relationship, got out of the relationship, paid some child support, actually saw his kids a little bit, he still could have gone on to get married another time. He still could have gone on to get his pilot's license, to buy a plane, do what, well, I guess the plane's debatable because I'm, it seems like he was spending money that should have gone to his children and other places. But you could still find your happy life. You don't need to do this to a bunch of people and hurt people in your former family, in your new family, in another family that you're barely familiar with because you were roommates with someone that was related to it. Just the level of selfishness in this story just really gets to me. And... That's, I guess there's something to that. We see this time and time again um, with these types of cases where someone just, they feel like they're more important than everyone around them and they just use these people around them for whatever personal gains they want. It's really kind of disappointing that humanity is able to go to those lengths, but um, I guess if we didn't have that, then we couldn't appreciate the good people that we have in our lives that stand up and actually try to help others. And uh, I don't know, guys. Really, really tough case. And once again, big, big thank you to Christy Arnhart for um, doing all the research, pulling that together, and helping me in all of my challenges that I've got coming up in 2019. 
Uh, I hope you guys will be there to help me through some of that stuff as well. So before we get to the comment review for last week's episode, I have several people I have to thank. New patrons, Karita Sudiertama. I, I'm pretty sure I messed that up, but I'm doing my best. Uh, Rachel Cooper and Lisa Orth are all new patrons. Thank you so much. And on top of that, Katie Gustin increased her pledge. Thank you so much, Katie. I really, really appreciate all of all of your support out there um, through Patreon, through PayPal, by buying stuff in the merch store. Are we going to have some new merch next year? Hmm. Do I have an artist working on a very special edition t-shirt? Might be limited time. I don't know if I'm going to do it limited time or do it, but I'm telling you guys, really cool special stuff coming next year, including finally some new intros. I'm just dropping all kinds of spoilers. Stay tuned, everyone. A lot of stuff coming up next year. So comments for last week's episode. That was the Injustice for Catrice Matthews episode, also known as the Dixmore Five. Um, a lot of you were really touched by that. Uh, uh, several of you actually thanked me for sharing that story, uh, for in some way trying to keep this young woman's name alive. Um, and also taking a look at this injustice, and that raises some questions for us. Is this going on with other people as well? I'm certain it is. Are those people as um, lucky? I don't know what else you would say. As the Dixmore Five, I don't know, because um, these guys really got a good team behind them. Uh, does that happen for everyone? I, I, I have a feeling it doesn't, but let's get to your comments, starting with Whitney Angeli. Sometimes I watch these videos and it really hits me just how much damage one person in one moment can really do. A young innocent girl lost her life. A mom will be forever heartbroken. A group of boys lost 20 years of their life in prison. And it's all because some pervert wanted what he wanted in the moment. If that doesn't shake you to the core, I don't know what will. Yes, Whitney. Uh, and it's interesting that comment kind of ties into how I was feeling about this episode. Yeah, some people just really have this level. I don't know if it's selfishness, if that's enough to describe it, because not only is it that they want something and they're willing to go to all kinds of extremes to have it, but they're also not considering what that means to the other people that are affected by what they're doing. And in this story, certainly. I mean, how how much of the news coverage of the Dixmore Five did this guy see, knowing these guys were going down for a crime they didn't commit, for something that he had done, and he let them sit in prison? I mean, I guess, of course, he's going to if he would do the awful things that he did to Catrice. That already shows that his level of humanity is just in a very different place than most of us out there. But to just know that you've ruined six people's lives and... Uh, you know, it might have been a little different if he turned himself in in this case, but unfortunately we don't have that. And I'm curious to see what happens with the proceedings on this. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's a tough one. Moving on to a comment from Lost. I am so happy that DNA has progressed over the years because there are just way too many people in prison over false confessions, false eyewitness statements, and lack of evidence. The fact that Willie was even allowed to walk the streets after being in jail 39 times is baffling. I feel like after a certain amount of times, he should have been in jail for the rest of his life. I just pray for Ketteris's mother and father because they have to suffer by going through a trial all over again and hearing the pain their daughter went through. Yes, lost. Uh, I couldn't say it better myself. And I also am happy for DNA. I'm happy to see the developments that have happened with the DNA, this whole angle now where they're using genealogy to track people down. I mean, this really, it feels like we're finally getting to a level where people are going to be held accountable in ways that they never imagined they could. I mean, just 10 or 15 years ago, no one thought that we were going to be using this DNA information with publicly available details to drill in on specific families that this DNA came from. Um, now, is, is there risks associated with that? Yes. Do I think that we have had false convictions where DNA evidence has been included? I'm pretty sure by this point we have, but DNA is a technology. It's constantly being worked on. There's new inventions that are always occurring around this area. So I'm hopeful that at some point, um, some extension of all this work 
is going to just make it better and hopefully weed out some of those also. But to your point about false confessions, DNA seems to be the silver bullet to help in those false confession cases uh, in a large way. Uh, there's, I think, only a very small number that I know about that uh, don't have some DNA component to actually overturn a, a false confession conviction. Bing's Ballyhoo. Is that Ballyhoo? There's two O's, so I would assume so. Uh, I hope the five men are getting the help they need. What a horrible thing. And I know it still happens as corruption goes unchallenged so much now. And I hope the mom has a good support group to help her through all this. Bless her heart. Uh, yeah, me too. And you know, even considering that these guys won this large amount of money, um, for that many years of your life, is it really worth it? I don't know. I hope that they're using a part of those proceeds to get some emotional support, maybe some counseling, uh, whatever they need to deal with that. Because I got to tell you guys, if I went through what those guys went through, I'd probably be really bitter, angry. Um, I'm sure portions of my personality would be twisted in really bizarre ways. It could take years and years of therapy for those guys to un try to undo some of that. And will they ever be able to revert back to the innocence that they had at the age of 14 through 16? No, I don't, I don't think they're ever going to be able to get back to that. But there's a lot that could be done. And I hope that they are finding the tools to do that as well. Sage Kibitzer, hideous mess. There is no correcting it. All you can do is go forward with to whatever conclusion, hopefully correct this time, or let it lay and wither to nothing, as it will anyway with enough time passing. I know that sounds like a little bit of a downer, but I wanted to include that comment because there's a lot of truth to it. Um, there is no way to correct this. Uh, paying money to people for, for them being wronged in this way does not correct it. And of course, there's nothing that we can do to correct what happened to Katrisa. But uh, to the point that Sage, I think Sage is trying to raise, you have to stay aware of what has happened and move forward from that if you really want to try to address it. You might not be able to correct it, but I do think that you can address it. And I think that's a big part of the problem that we have um, as the public when we're seeing police departments that have gone through things like this. It would be extremely easy for me to look at this case and say, wow, those police departments are just absolute garbage and you know everyone should be fired and we should just restaff the thing from top to bottom. But the truth of it is they blew it. They made a mistake. We're all humans. We all make mistakes. And I think that we have to allow that some of these mistakes are going to happen. Could something like this have been routed out early on and not led to these guys spending all those years in prison? Yes, I totally believe that. Something is broken, broken in the process here. But to Sage's point, if we can be aware of what's broken in this process and move forward from that, keeping that in mind, perhaps we can address it. Perhaps we can make things better for future instances where something like this could happen. Uh, and I do believe at least based on my impression I got from the press conference, uh, that's really what the investigators working on this case now, um, that's really the approach they were trying to take. Even their comment about, yeah, we know we have DNA, but we're not only going to rely on that, shows that there was an awareness that has happened because of the previous investigation of this case. So that makes me hopeful. Um, and that's part of a thing that's kind of tough sometimes when we see police departments in this position. We don't always get this new approach that kind of comes through or people that are willing and brave enough to speak publicly to say, look, we know that something went really wrong here and we're going to do our best to try to correct that. Um, there seems to be, I don't want to say a bravado, but there seems to be this aspect of Let's just hush hush about it. No one talk about these bad things. We don't have to admit that we did anything wrong. And to the point of the second half of Sage's comment, if enough time passes, everyone's just going to forget about this anyway. That might have been true way in the past, but there's an interesting aspect that we have now, once again, with technology and social media, and that is that people don't have to forget about any of these instances. If someone's brave enough to start a new blog, make a new video, re-raise these issues, all of a sudden thousands of people can reawaken to these issues time and time again, going on honestly in forever. I mean, it just, we've covered cases here that are 30, 40, 50 years old. 
Um, so don't get so comfortable with that feeling that, you know, everyone just be quiet about it. No one talk about it. It's just going to fade off into the past. I don't think I don't think those days are here anymore with modern tech, but that's just where I'm at with it. I hope you'll let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today, everyone. I really appreciate you out there. Please come back on Wednesday when we look into another missing person case on Brain Scratch Searchlight right here on the Lord and Arts channel.